Hello and welcome to video four of chapter 15, uh, which will focus on proton NMR. Um, we, some learning objectives for the video, um, you should be able to draw and interpret splitting diagrams. Uh, for these types of problems, um, if uh, you need coupling constants, you will be given them in a similar fashion to what you see in the problem set problems in OneNote. Um, You'll learn how to predict and interpret a proton NMR spectra for alkanes, alkyl halides, ethers, alcohols, and alkenes. So after watching this video, you want to try tackling the following problems in your uh, proton NMR problem set. So let's go ahead and get started. So in video three, I left off with kind of a big cliffhanger about um, splitting, or as your textbook refers to it, the multiplicity. So um, let's just review real quickly um, what you already know about splitting using that n plus one rule. So I already told you that um, the splitting can be used to determine how many uh, protons are on uh, the neighboring um, carbon atom next door to the absorbing proton. That's kind of what we already know. Um, so let's look at uh, an example here um, of an alkyl halide and uh, the n plus one rule works really nicely um, for, for compounds like this. Um, so let's just review a little bit before we dive into uh, more, the more details about splitting. So what are the important features of a proton NMR spectrum that we have taken a look at? So we said the first one was um, how many uh, proton environments there are, because that tells us how many uh, um, signals we're going to see in the proton NMR spectrum for that structure. Um, and then the next thing that we want to look at, um, so I'm saying like, what is it, is the chemical shift like chemical shifts of those signals. That's going to help us. That's How is that going to help us? Well, we're going to know something about the electronic environment around those protons. If they're heavily shielded, they're going to be uh, upfield. And if they're deshielded, they're going to be downfield. So just a reminder that shielded, upfield, that means to the right. And uh, deshielded, downfield, we're going to go to the left in the NMR spectrum. And then we can look at the intensities, the areas under the peak or under the signals, and that um, tells us the relative number of hydrogens when we're comparing that to the other areas under signals, and then the splitting. Okay, so this is just a little bit of uh, review from our previous uh, videos. So uh, if we look at, um, our compound here, we have a CH, uh, sorry, CH and a CH2, right? And uh, so we expect there to be uh, two proton environments, so two signals. So I'm just gonna make a note here, we expect to see two of those. For in terms of the chemical shifts, so um, both of these protons are part of an alkyl bromide. So if I pull out and remember on um, an exam, you will be given um, the chemical shifts that you need. So for an alkyl bromide, uh, we expect that signal to be downfield relative to uh, if it's just an alkyl uh, proton. So uh, we expect around 3.4 to 3.6, but really you just want to think like it's going to be farther downfield than what you would see in normal CH or CH2. Now between uh, these two signals, you already know that you would expect this to one to be the farthest downfield because uh, it has two electron withdrawing groups attached to that carbon, whereas this one just has one. So we expect this signal to absorb the farthest downfield. And then for this signal here, for the CH2, that will be a little bit farther upfield, but these are gonna be you know, in the three to four range in terms of PPM. Uh, in terms of their intensities, the CH is going to absorb, uh, you know, it'll be at a ratio of one, whereas this is at a ratio of two. 
And then let's evaluate the splitting. So since we're gonna dive into why we see the splitting that we do. So let's just focus in on one of the signals to try to explain uh, the splitting that we see. So let's go ahead and look at this proton environment here. I'm gonna go ahead and say that we're gonna focus on these absorbing protons, okay? And we know from our n plus one rule what we expect to see for how this signal would be split. Since there is next door one proton neighbor, we expect using the n plus one rule, we expect this to be two peaks or a doublet, right? So uh, why is that the case? I'm gonna go through a little explanation of this. This piece down here is not important for you to be able to reproduce on an exam. Uh, so I just wanna give you a heads up about that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. So when we place this um, in an applied magnetic field, so here we've got our B naught, um, the adjacent proton, and again, so we're looking at, uh, when we're evaluating the absorbing, these absorbing protons, um, the neighbor here, the adjacent proton, can either be aligned with the magnetic field or against the magnetic field. Okay. And because of this, the absorbing protons feel two slightly different magnetic fields. One that's slightly larger in strength and one that's uh, slightly smaller in strength than the applied magnetic field. So since the absorbing protons feel two different magnetic fields, they absorb at two different frequencies in the NMR spectrum. And so we see the signal get split into a doublet, okay? So um, if, there's, if there are no adjacent, no neighboring H's, then the absorbing um, hydrogen or hydrogens, if you have like here more than one hydrogen in the same environment, uh, they just feel one magnetic field and then you get a singlet. But if you have, and like we're looking at in this case, there's one neighbor, that is going to either be aligned or anti-parallel uh, going against the magnetic field, we see then that it, these protons feel two different uh, magnetic fields, and so they absorb at two different frequencies, and the signal is split into a doublet or has a multiplicity of two. Okay? This distance here, between the two peaks when we have splitting, um, that distance can be measured in hertz, okay? And that frequency distance uh, between the two peaks here is what we call the coupling constant, which is abbreviated with a J. Okay? And for alkyl or, or alkane uh, protons, we usually see um, a coupling constant that is around uh, seven hertz. So this is gonna be around seven hertz. And we're gonna look at examples of other um, coupling constants as well. So coupling constants range anywhere from zero to around 18 hertz, okay? And for alkanes, we're going to see that they're around seven hertz, okay? Um, you do not need to memorize um, coupling constants. If I want you to use coupling constants to draw a splitting diagram, I will always give them to you. I'm gonna go through some general trends of what we see for coupling constants, but you're not required to uh, memorize that, okay? Um, and so, Let's take a look. So we know this signal here is going to be split up into a doublet. What about uh, this signal here? If this is environment A and this is environment B, how do we expect B to be split? 
Well, it has two neighboring protons that are in a different environment from it. So two plus one is three. So we see three peaks or a triplet. Okay. All right, so we're gonna um, do some more examples of this um, and we're gonna learn how to draw splitting diagrams. Just a reminder that I, I know I keep saying this over and over again, that's just because I can't say it enough. Um, equivalent protons do not split each other. So in our example up here, this proton is equivalent to this one, so they can't split each other. Okay. Um, another example, uh, let's do real quick, let's take butane. CH2, CH2, CH3. So if I wanted to investigate the splitting uh, for this signal, um, first you always want to go through and label your proton environments. So I have, starting with the methyl groups, I have A, and look, this is also in the same environment as this. Okay. Uh, both of them are methyl groups attached to a CH2 that's attached to a CH2 that's attached to a CH3. And if you want to draw your little line of symmetry there, you can. All right, and then this is environment B and this is environment B. So when I'm determining the splitting of signal B, I can't count these because they're in the same environment. So A is not equivalent to B and it's next door, so it can split B. So three plus one is four, so I'm gonna see four peaks. So that's a quartet. Okay. And then here I'm going to see, so two neighbors, two plus one is three, so three peaks or a triplet. Okay, and in terms of their chemical shifts, we expect this to be the farthest upfield, a little less than one, and then this will be a little bit uh, down a little bit farther downfield relative to this, but these are going to be way up to the right in the spectrum. Okay, so let's um, let's go ahead and uh, do some more examples of this. So let's say um, and and let's just go ahead and take this example here. With I'm going to tell you that the the coupling constants for these I'll say J alkyl is equal to seven hertz. Could we draw a splitting diagram for each of these signals? Yes, it would be super easy. So if you have to draw a splitting diagram for something that you can determine the splitting for with the n plus one rule, it's super easy. What do I mean? Okay, let's start. Here's our HA signal. And it has two neighbors that are not equivalent to it. So I need to apply this coupling constant two times. So the first time, it's seven hertz in length, or in, in that uh, difference here. So I have seven hertz between these, okay? So this is from one HB, but we have two HBs, so I need to do this again. So starting at the lines we left off at, I have to split it again by seven. Since the coupling constant for this HB is the same as this, it makes it easy because it overlaps perfectly in the middle. Seven and seven. And so you end up getting, if you look at the spectrum, you get this one to twice as big to one. Okay, here's our triplet in a ratio of one to two to one, okay? So we can use the coupling constants. This is where the splitting comes from. Now we can use the n plus one rule here uh, to do this much faster, but on an exam, I could have maybe one question or so that asks you to draw a splitting diagram. So this is an example of a splitting diagram. Could we do it for the HB signal? Certainly, let's do that. I'll make it in a different color. So let's do HB, here we go. Here's HB. Now how many neighbors does it have? Remember I can't count these because they're equivalent. We have three HAs and this is the coupling constant. I have to apply this three times since there are three neighbors. So here I've got my, I'll try to make it 
Uh, in OneNote, when you're practicing this, if you want, you can apply a grid to the paper and it just makes it easier uh, to do the counting. But here, since it's uh, the coupling constant is the same, it makes it easy. So this is seven hertz. This is still seven. So this was an HA, this is another HA, and I have to do it again. So it, again, it's gonna overlap perfectly in the middle. That's so nice and pretty. We'll see in a few minutes examples where we don't have that. So what do we end up with here? One, two, three, four peaks, okay? And if I draw what this would look like, we have this. Okay. So here we said that this was supposed to be a quartet. This is how, how you get that. Okay. And um, if this is our ratio here of one to two to one, we have this at one to three to three to one. Uh, and again, you're not gonna be tested on these ratios, so if your head is exploding about that, uh, don't worry about it. But if you're reading the textbook, then uh, you know where these ratios come from. Okay, um, Okay. so this was a super easy case. So alkyl, if you're just dealing with alkyl proton environments, the N plus one rule works great, and if you're drawing splitting diagrams, it's super easy. And we start to have a much more challenging time when we're dealing with protons on sp2 hybridized carbons because if the protons on the sp2 hybridized carbon are not equivalent to each other they can split one another so this is a big deal so um, this is where oftentimes we're going to see that using that n plus one rule won't um, always consistently work. So let's go ahead and um, get started uh, practicing that. So I, if I am going to um, make you do an example of a splitting diagram where the coupling constants are not all the same, um, I'm going to give you coupling constants. You will never have to just pull these out of thin air. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So um, let's take a look at, here we have um, an ether and an alkene, okay? And we're given coupling constants and we're asked to draw the splitting diagrams so that we can uh, predict the multiplicities for all of the signals that we're gonna expect to see for this in the proton NMR spectrum. So if you want to challenge yourself and pause the video and do the problem um, and then start it up again when you're ready to uh, check your answer, uh, you, can, you can do that. Um, why don't we go ahead and you can pause the video now if you want to try it yourself. Okay, so um, the first thing that I like to do is label my proton environments. When I see the alkene, I get a little wary because it's not immediately obvious to me whether or not these two are in the same environment or in different environments. So I'm gonna go ahead and redraw this. So I have my CH3 attached to a CH2, attached to an oxygen that's attached to an sp2 hybridized carbon with an H over here. So I think I mentioned in one of the earlier videos that when you have um, an alkene where at one end it's unsubstituted, these protons out here are referred to as uh, geminal protons. Um, you'll notice up here this coupling constant, J gem, this stands for geminal. So geminal protons have really small coupling constants. And so you'll notice in the problem set, uh, with some of the problems where you're given the proton uh, NMR spectrum, and in the alkene region, you'll sometimes see me um, label it as small J value, which means a small coupling constant. And that's your clue that you have geminal protons. Um, okay. So let's go ahead now and label the proton environments here. How many do we have? So I'd like to start with my methyl first. So I'm gonna label this 
A, there are no other methyl groups, right? So there are no other protons equivalent to that environment. Uh, here we have a CH2 group. And this is definitely different than this CH2 group since this is on an sp3 hybridized carbon, this is an sp2 hybridized carbon, okay? And then uh, we have here, this hydrogen is in its own environment. It's part of a CH, there are no other CHs. Um, and then over here now, hopefully it's clear, we don't have a plane of symmetry here, right? We don't have a plane of symmetry here. These proton environments are different from each other. So if I label this one D, I'll call this one E. So that's one, two, three, four, five signals that we expect to see in the proton NMR spectrum of the compound. So five signals. After signals, we look at chemical shift. Okay, which of these signals do we expect to be the farthest up field? Up field, shielded. We expect this one to be the farthest up field. I'm just going to make a note of that. Okay. And then um, we've got here the ether piece going on and an alkene. Okay. So protons that are close to an ether or protons that are part of an alkene, we know are downfield in terms of their signal relative to alkane protons. So of the remaining proton environments, which one should we guess to be the farthest down field? So if I look at my proton NMR um, chemical shifts, right, I see here, so um, these are al alkene protons, okay, so if something is a uh, vanillic Vanillic protons are attached to an sp2 hybridized carbon and a carbon-carbon double bond, right? So we see their chemical shift downfield relative to alkanes. Uh, the other vanillic, if it's a CH instead of a CH2, uh, if you look at that, that's even farther uh, downfield. And then if you look at uh, ethers, right, those usually um, are not as downfield as the alkenes, okay? So what this means is, um, so these protons are part of an alkene. This proton is part of an alkene and it's connected to, the carbon is connected to an oxygen. So I expect this to be the farthest downfield and I expect it to be farther downfield than this. Since these, this, we would just say, okay, you've got the ether piece, right? Um, and alkenes in general, we expect all three of these to be farther downfield relative to signal B. Okay? But of these, we expect this one to be the farthest down field. Okay? So I'm going from downfield to upfield, I expect to see HC. And then whether or not you see which one comes next, we don't, we don't know, and you don't have to be able to predict, but these will be in the alkene region, but not as far downfield as this. And then we expect this next, and then this to be the farthest upfield. Okay, so now let's talk about the uh, splitting. Okay, so uh, what do we expect? Why don't we, it's, it's always good when you're working these problems, like start with what is easiest. What is easiest here? Well, definitely the alkane protons are gonna be the easiest, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead for HA. Um, I'm my coupling constant here, J alkyl, so we can use this for alkanes. Um, so for protons attached to an sp3 hybridized carbon that don't have an electron withdrawing group directly bonded to them, right? Um, so, uh, let's go ahead and do that. So how many neighbors? We have two HBs. So I have to apply this coupling constant two times. So we spec if this is seven hertz here and then another seven hertz. Okay, so we expect to see a, sorry, that's a little messy. Um, we expect to see a triplet, right? And using the N plus one rule, that's what we would expect to see. All right, let's do HB next. So HB has three neighbors, so I have to apply this coupling constant three times. 
So here is my first 7 hertz split, then start at the ends. We overlap in the middle since the coupling constant is 7, because you're going 3 and a half, 3 and a half. Okay. And then we have to apply it a third time. Okay. And so here I expect to see that quartet, which is what I would expect with the n plus 1 rule. Okay, so now let's go ahead and dive into HC. So let's get HC going. So what can split this proton? So you can, uh, this proton can be split or a proton can be split by unequivalent protons two or th and or three bonds away from it. So this is bond number one, this is bond number two, and then the oxygen to carbon bond is bond number three. So there were no protons there, right? Because you, if you went to these, that would be the fourth bond. So it's these protons don't split this. Similarly, these protons don't split this. Well, let's look in the other direction. Bond one, now you don't count a double bond twice, so this is bond two, and then bond three. HD is in a different environment than HC, so it splits it. And HE is in a different environment than C, so it splits it. Now what's trickier about this compared to these two examples is we're going to have two different coupling constants for these. Why? The coupling constant for protons that are cis to each other is a little bit less than the coupling constant for protons that are trans to each other, which is usually around 15 hertz, okay? So I have to use each of these coupling constants one time. In order to simplify your life, start with the bigger coupling constant always and work your way down to the smaller ones. So I'm going to start with my 15 hertz split. I'm going to make it bigger than that 7 hertz. Right, this is our 15 hertz split. So this is HC being split by HE. And now I have to have the split for the HD. So that's the 12 hertz. So that does not overlap here. So what is this gonna look like? Well here you're gonna end up with a doublet of doublets and they're each in a ratio of one to one to one to one so you can't confuse it with a quartet right because in a quartet the two inner peaks are much bigger than the two outer peaks so this is referred to as a doublet of doublets why we have the doublet that's split up into a doublet. All right. So notice that if you had tried to use the n plus one rule here, on the neighbor were two protons, so you would have guessed a triplet. This is definitely not a triplet. Okay. All right, so now let's look at um, HD. Let's do that one next. So what is splitting HD? So it has HE. What is the relationship between these two? Is this referred to as cis? No, it is geminal. These have a very small coupling constant. This is the one hertz split, okay? All right, and then what is the relationship between HD and HC? These are cis to each other, so then that's the 12, okay? So again, notice that this is one two bonds away and not equivalent. This one is one, two, three bonds away and not equivalent. All right, let's do this. So a uh, coupling constant for J cis is 12 hertz. So again, if you do this on graphing paper, it makes it a little easier. Um, and then we do J gem, that's just one hertz. That's just a little one there. So here we also get a doublet of doublets, but we have, let me make that the same. 
Notice that this distance here is much smaller than what we saw here. Okay, So this is very indicative. You'll see me write on um, some of the NMR spectra examples. Um, you know, I'll, I'll circle something and say small j value. And that's referring to this distance here because we had a really small j value. And that's your clue that you've got geminal protons. Okay, so you've got uh, sp2 hybridized carbon, part of a carbon-carbon double bond with two hydrogens on it. That's, that's going to really help you on exams. All right, now what about, um, and so notice again here that if we use the n plus 1 rule, we would get screwed up. Because there are a total of four peaks here, but this is a doublet of doublets again. Okay, still a doublet of doublets. Each of these has the same ratio to each other, one to one to one to one. Um, and if we had just used the n plus one rule, we would have gotten a triplet, and that's not what we would observe in the proton NMR spectrum. Okay, so now let's do He. All right, so HE has the, a geminal, uh, HD is geminal to it, and then it has a trans to HC, so that's the 15 hertz one. I'll start with that one first. So here we have 15 hertz, and then the geminal split of one. So again, another doublet of doublets. Make that look even, okay? And this distance here, because uh, HD was cis to HC, that's why this distance here is smaller than this one, where these two are trans to each other, okay? All right, so we're gonna have lots of fun drawing um, these splitting diagrams. Now, uh, let's take a look then at uh, the proton NMR spectrum. So I'm just going to use a computer-generated one just to keep our lives uh, simple. So for this compound, remember what, what we predicted. We expected this to be the farthest upfield signal. Uh, we would expect it a little less than one or you know, around, I should say, actually a little bit farther downfield than one since it's got the oxygen here. If it was just, if this whole compound was just an alkane, then it would be a little less than one. All right, but this should be the farthest upfield. And that's uh, what we see here, okay? We see a triplet here. And on exams, in addition to the proton NMR spectrum, you also are gonna be given uh, integrations, and that tells you how many hydrogens are making up the signal. You'll notice on the practice problems, I don't give you the integrations, um, but on exams, you'll see them. So this is for three H's, this is for uh, here, uh, these are, I'm just going to write H's, H, H. Okay, so we said that this we expected to see the farthest downfield, okay, and we thought it would be a doublet of doublets, and I look down here and there is a doublet of doublets, so this, um, this region here is the alkene region, right? Um, now, because of the ether, right? Uh, we see here this one, two, three, four. This is a quartet that integrates for two protons. So this must be the CH2 that's attached to the oxygen. And this is what I mean by, I'm gonna tell you small j value for these signals, and that's your clue that these are the proton signals for the geminal protons. Now it is not necessary for you to assign which one is for HD and which one is for HE. Okay, that's, you don't need to be able to do that, okay? All right, so let's do some more examples, see how much more, what kind of fun we can have with this. All right, um, just a reminder about that in case you didn't write that down, it's pretty important. So let's go ahead and draw the splitting diagrams uh, that we expect to find for the protons that are labeled in red. So let's go ahead here and start with HA. Okay, so there's not a proton here. So let's see, one, two, three brings us to the C. So these protons are too far away 
to split this. All right, that's good. One, two, three. So HB can split HA. What's the relationship between these two? They are cis to each other. That tells me I need to use this coupling constant. Again, you'll be given the coupling constants. All right, so here we have a split of 12. So I expect to see a doublet, okay? All right, so two peaks, a doublet. All right, what about for HB? And again, where would we expect this chemical shift? In the alkene region, but shifted a little bit more downfield because of the bromine here, okay? So in comparing these two signals, I would expect this one to be farther downfield relative to this. All right, let's get to HB. HB, again, proton neighbors. We've got one, two, three. So HA is going to split it. It's cis to it. Boom. Now what about these? Do they split it? One, two, three. Ooh. So these are all three of these split this. So I have, uh, let's see, let's write down J alkyl is equal to seven hertz. Okay, I got, I'll tell you that. So this is going to be a little messier. Let's uh, see how I can, let's see how, how, where, how much room I need. So uh, seven hertz versus this splitting here was 12 hertz. So I'll start with the 12 hertz first. Okay. And then if we want to go ahead and say, all right, we are going to have next three at seven hertz. So let's do a little bit of math here. Don't, don't panic too much. So going in this direction was six and this direction was six. Now, if I have to go in this direction, seven, oh, this is going to be a mess. So half of seven is three and a half. So I'm going to come just over halfway here and go like this. So that this here is representing seven. I should have done this on a paper, um, graph paper rather. Okay. So then I made that a little too far. I can see, but that's okay. So this is one of these. Now I have to do this two more times. Now, when I do this two more times, at least this will overlap in the middle. So I can do that piece and I'm going to be messy with this and that's okay because what you're going to notice, and I have to do it one more time. So these are each seven. Okay. And if I did it on graph paper, I would make this look prettier. So what you should take away from what is going to result whoops, uh, as being a big mess is that it quickly can become a big mess. So with this, what you are going to say is this is a multiplet, right? It has many peaks. It's gonna look like a big mess in the proton NMR spectrum. And by big mess, I mean something like this, like where you're gonna be like, I can't count that. So um, in terms of a splitting diagram on an exam, like don't freak out. Uh, again, I'm gonna make you practice, I think one hard one on the practice problems, and I recommend you use graph paper for it, but I, really you end up with a big mess. And we're just going to say multiplet for that. Okay, let's try these other ones here. So uh, let's try this one, HB. So this HB turned out to be a big mess. And notice that the N plus one rule, we definitely have more than four. This is more than five peaks, right? Okay, let's go to HB here. So um, this is going to get split by this and it's going to be split by this. We're going to, it's going to also be a big mess where we just start off with a bigger, we'll have 15 Hertz to start with. Okay. So I should, I should have just left B be the big mess. Um, so I'll make this one look a little bigger. This is the 15 Hertz. And then I need to do three of these at seven Hertz. This one will be a little neater though. So there's my seven, 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 seven. 
Sorry, that should have been in the middle here. Sorry. Let's see if I can fix that so it doesn't look so messy. I'm sorry, it looks a little messy. There's seven hertz there, seven hertz there. And then we gotta split it one more time. Okay. All right. Seven, and that overlaps there. Okay. So the take home message here, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Um, this is not, you, you cannot call this an octet um, because it won't have the same ratio uh, uh, pattern, okay? It will be another pretty big mess, okay? So you can go ahead and say multiplet. What is HA going to look like? So let's see, one, two, three. Yay, we don't have to worry about those. There's no proton here. HA is going to be really easy because it's just split by HB. Okay, this would be an easy one on an exam. So we have the trans split. So that's just 15. Okay, so that's going to be two peaks. That's going to be a doublet. The ratio of one to one. All right, uh, let's see. Um, let's take a look. I think we already did one like this, um, but uh, let's just do it again. Uh, let's do this HC. So the biggest um, split or the biggest rather coupling constant is for the trans. So I'll do that one first. So that's the 15 hertz. And then we have the 12 for the cis. So that's not gonna overlap in the middle. Right. So here we have a doublet of doublets. Okay. DD for doublet of doublets, four peaks, each with a ratio of one to one to one to one. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get started then. So um, you can do the rest for HA and HB and um, uh, ask about them in help sessions. We can go over those. But let's uh, do some more examples. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at, let's use the same coupling constants that I had on the previous page. And uh, why don't we check out the, probably the hardest, which of these do we expect to be the hardest one to draw the splitting diagram for? So let's see, HA, one, two, three. So it gets split by two of these, one, two, three, and HC. Now, does HC get split by HB? One, two, three. No, because the protons are not here. They're out on the fourth bond. So, um, and then let's look at HB. What does it get split by? So. Um, imagine you have to count one, that's the first bond, two, three. So they only get split by HA. So of these three, this one would be the hardest splitting diagram to draw. So let's do that one. HA, they kind of all start to blur together. So a, J trans was 15 hertz. And again, I would give that to you. 15 hertz, okay. Now I have to apply the seven hertz split for the alkane alkyl group protons. Um, and I need to do that two times. And at least with this one, it's not as messy and they're not gonna overlap in the middle. If you work out the math on that, you'll see. Okay. All right. So we're going to end up with one, two, three, four, five, six peaks. Would we call this a sextet? No, it's not going to look like a sextet. It's going to look like you have a, a doublet that is then split up into a triplet. Okay. Um, let's move on. Oh, let's talk a little bit about, I think we saw an example earlier with uh, an ether. Um, just to mention that uh, if you're dealing with an ether, uh, let's just do the simplest one we can. Okay, 
So the chemical, there's just one proton environment here, right? Um, the signal that we expect for HA is going to be farther downfield than it would be if this was an alkane, right? And if we look at our chemical shift here, so ether or alcohol uh, protons, so you can shift, see it shifted farther downfield. So much farther downfield than a normal CH3, okay? All right. Um, so I don't know, this would be something around, let's say 3.2 ppm, you know, okay? Uh, what would the splitting be? It would just be a singlet. Okay. All right, let's um, move on to alcohols next. So alcohols, I've emailed you and put in your problem set some tips about that. So alcohols, you have a sp3 hybridized carbon that's bonded to an OH group in an alcohol, right? And the proton signal for the hydrogen attached to the oxygen is notoriously inconsistent. Now I am aware that on your handout here, you see this, it says ether or alcohol, and it gives you this really narrow range. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that protons attached to the oxygen in an alcohol can vary wildly beyond that. And I have seen them I'm gonna give you a much larger range in reality, like from one to six hertz, or PP, I should say PPM. They're, um, they tend to have a broad signal and they're never split. Now we can do something that we call the D2O shake. This is a very exchangeable proton and you'll see in some of the problem set problems that I put a little star on top of a signal um, and that is to tell you that you have a alcohol proton signal there. So um, if you do a shake, a D2O shake, so this is just heavy water, the deuterium will replace this hydrogen before, because it won't replace this is a uh, very, very uh, exchangeable. It can be popped off and the deuterium can come on uh, much more readily than like with an alkane, you would never see that kind of exchange. Um, and what happens when deuterium replaces the uh, hydrogen, the proton hydrogen, um, is that the signal disappears. So when, you see, when I put a little star above it, I'm telling you, this signal disappears with a D2O shake, and that's your indication that it's the proton in the alcohol signal, okay? Now, what about if you're dealing with, let's look at an example of an alcohol, okay? One of my favorite alcohols. So um, this we know is gonna be a singlet. It tends to be a broad, signal you'll be able to know which one it is because i'm going to put a star above it and say that it disappears with the d2o shake let's take a look at this proton environment here we know that the chemical shift will be farther downfield than a normal ch2 group because of the oh but let's talk about the splitting so this proton can never split the neighbor so don't count this proton in the neighbor count. So the splitting for this environment is three plus one. So that is four peaks, so that is a quartet. Okay, all right, so now let's practice. We've looked at alkanes, alkenes, alkyl halides, ethers, and alcohols. And what we've been focusing on is going from the structure to predicting the proton NMR spectrum. Now we're gonna start to practice in reverse because that's the way that chemists are usually having to do this. We carry out a chemical reaction, we try to purify our product, and uh, then we'll do NMR 
to evaluate the structure of the compound. So we're usually having to evaluate an NMR spectrum to see what did we make. All right, and on um, all of your exams, you're going to notice, so this is a really important chapter because it doesn't go away. You're going to see proton NMR spectra for the rest of the semester. And that's why you have so much practice at it, and that's why we spend much more time on it um, compared with other chapters because we're gonna use this for the rest of the semester. So you need to be able to deduce the structure of an alkane, an alkyl halide, an ether, an alcohol, and an alkene based on its proton NMR spectrum, and you will be given the molecular formula. And I usually give you some other little tidbit about it, like this is a um, unsubstituted uh, or monosubstituted uh, alkene or, you know, a, a, a secondary alkyl halide, something like that. So um, I want to give you a systematic way for going about how to solve the problem. I'm going to actually add in a step zero now that I'm thinking about it, and that's to start off with use what you are given because I'm usually going to give you a piece of information that's really critical about telling you um, limits to the structure like it's a primary halide versus a secondary halide or a tertiary halide. The next thing that I want you to do is I want you to find the degrees of unsaturation what I call the DU now, if you're reading your textbook, they do this, but they call it something different. They call it the hydrogen deficiency index, okay? Um, you don't have to memorize the formula because I'm gonna give it to you on exams, uh, but um, I just, I'm gonna write it out like this. DU is equal to the number of carbons. So remember, you're gonna be given the molecular formula you're going to add one to the number of carbons. And since um, I'm limiting you right now to alkanes, alkenes, alkyl halides, ethers, and alcohols, I'm not going to include um, the nitrogens in, here, in the formula. Once we get to um, that, I'll, I'll change this formula. Okay, so then we're going to take half of the number of H's. And if there are halogens, we have to add that into the H count too. So I'm gonna use HAL for halogens. Okay, so remember a degree of unsaturation or a hydrogen deficiency index of zero means that there are no double bonds. If there are no double, because a double bond counts for one degree of unsaturation, a triple bond counts for two. So they. If you have a degree of unsaturation of zero, you also can't have any triple bonds. And then a ring is a degree of unsaturation. So with each ring is another degree. So if you have a degree of unsaturation of zero, no rings, no multiple bonds. All right, um, the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to count the number of uh, signals. So remember that the number of signals tells you the number of proton environments. All right, and then you're going to look at the chemical shift. So the chemical shift is going to be really useful for deciding, uh, you know, which signals are from alkene protons, or is there are there signals that um, are attached to something that's really electron withdrawing, like an alkyl halide or an oxygen, okay? And then the last thing that we're gonna look at is the splitting, because we can use that to determine the number of proton neighbors, okay? And the very last thing I guess you could write for yourself for number five is the integration. And uh, when you practice the problems, you don't have the integration, but on an exam, you'll see above a signal that I, I'll write the number, and that refers to the number of protons making up that signal. 
So if you want to, for practice, when you're doing the practice problems and you're looking at a proton MR spectrum, when you're done, you can go back and fill in the integration. But it's just kind of like the um, icing on the cake, if you will. All right, so let's start off with an example. And what we want to do is come up with the structure of the secondary halide. And um, a secondary halide with this formula. So first of all, what is a secondary halide? So uh, since we know it's a chlorine, I'm going to go ahead and write the chlorine. So that chlorine is attached to a carbon that's a secondary carbon. So that means that it has two other carbons on it. So this must be a CH. So if you want, I'm going to just change this to a CH. Okay. So step zero is really just interpreting the given. This was the given, a secondary halide with this formula. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to find the degrees of unsaturation. So let's do that. Four plus one is five. And then I have to subtract off. So if I take the sum of these, nine plus one is 10, half of that is five, I get zero. So no rings, no multiple bonds. It's just an alkyl halide. That's useful information before we get started predicting the structure. The next thing we're gonna do is we're going to look at the number of signals. Now, unfortunately, I picked an example where here I have overlapping signals. So I just wanted to point out what we see here. There's one, there are two signals here, two, three, four signals. So four signals, means that you have four proton environments. Okay, actually I need a blank piece. I might grab a blank piece of paper if I'm doing this problem. All right, so this signal here, we have actually two overlapping signals. This up here is the, the doublet, and because of its intensity, it must integrate for a lot more, uh, a lot of protons, okay? Um, and then if I look down here, this is an odd multiplet, um, and I'm telling you that it's a quintet, so that's five peaks. Okay, I guess I, you really can see that, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, but this up here is the, the doublet. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do after evaluating the number of signals and recognizing that we have, so we have four carbons to attach hydrogens to, and we have four proton environments. So we, we're not gonna have a symmetrical compound, okay? Um, when you have lots of equivalencies, then you have a fewer number of signals than compared with the number of carbons you can put protons on, right? Okay, so after the number of signals, we wanna look at the chemical shifts. And I, my preference is to do the extremes first and then work my way in. The signal that's the farthest up field and it happens to be just below one ppm, this is where I expect to see CH3s, right? So I expect this to be due to a CH3 and after we um, evaluate the chemical shift, we, we evaluate the splitting. Well, this is a triplet. That means it's attached to a CH2. Then let's go all the way up here. So this chemical shift, what in our formula tells us we should have a chemical shift far downfield? Well, it must be a proton that's attached to the carbon that the chlorine is on. Well, here we have this piece up here already started, so let's use it. So we expect if I label, let's say that this one is proton environment A, then let's call this proton environment B. Okay, and then let's look at the splitting of this. So this is an even numbered uh, splitting. I see one, two, three, four, five, six peaks. Well, that means it should have five neighboring, so five neighbors. Okay, how do we get five neighbors? 
Well, one way we could get five neighbors is to have um, the CH attached to a CH3 and a CH2. So I'm I get still not sure what's out here yet, but notice that I've got uh, pieces here. So um, we've got two signals in here. Uh, one of them is a doublet and one of them is a quintet. Okay. So if notice that with the pieces I have so far, a CH3 attached to a CH2, I don't have that anywhere here. I have a CH3 attached to a CH. Okay. Now, how many carbons are we supposed to have in this compound? Four. Well, this is piece I have right now is bigger than this one. So I'm going to use this one to continue. I've got one, two, three. I have one more carbon. Well, then that must mean this is a CH3. So now let's, let's figure this out. This must be this. Okay. So the triplet here, the sextet here. Now, what is this carbon missing? It has, let's see, one, two, three, four bonds. Okay, that's good. Um, so we have this signal. This is a different environment. Let's call that C, and I'll call this one D. So what do we expect this CH2 to split as? It has three, four neighbors. So we expect uh, that to be a quartet. Now, do we have a quartet here? No? Then maybe we did something wrong, right? Let's see. Three, four, oh, wait a minute. I did something wrong. Oh, it's a teachable moment. Three plus three, and this one is four. Using the n plus one rule, this should be a quintet. Five. Aha. Cool. Oh, I can't now spell. Quintet. Five peaks. Whew. All right. So that must be this one here. And now let's evaluate this other methyl environment. This one we expect to be farther downfield relative to this because it's closer to the chlorine. It has one neighbor. So this we expect to be a doublet. Okay. All right, and do we see that? Yes, we do. And this CH3, which is attached to a CH, is farther downfield relative to the signal for this CH3, okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop the video here. I tell you what, I will put another video up with just some more practice of doing these types of problems next, and then we'll get started on carbon NMR after that, okay? Stay tuned.